And if you have your Bible with you this morning, I encourage you to open to the book of Isaiah, chapter 9. Isaiah, chapter 9. And I want to read the sixth verse, one that we hear often this time of year. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I'm going to stop there. I pray and hope that you have all had a blessed Christmas holiday. Whether you want to celebrate that as the world does or not, I am thankful for an opportunity for a day that is set aside that much of the world wants to ignore Jesus Christ. Much of the world wants to ignore him, wants to deny him, wants to say that he doesn't exist, wants to say that he's not who he said he was. Whatever the case may be, there is a day in the year that at least challenges the world to think about him. I'm thankful for that. And, and I hope that you've all had a blessed Christmas holiday. I know the year's been different. I haven't been able to gather with family as we normally do. And it's times of loss and suffering and sickness seem to be abounding this time of year. And it has been all year. It's been a hard year. I know that. <coughs> but I hope, and if you haven't so far, I hope this morning helps you with that. I hope that the understanding, that a moment of, of considering the truth, the reality that Jesus Christ was born. That is a blessed truth for us to know and to understand. That there was indeed a child that was born nearly 2,000 years ago. Do I believe it was December 25th? No, not necessarily. I don't believe that. But that doesn't matter. Nearly 2,000 years ago, there was a night that an angel appeared before a shepherd. And there's a message in that. It's not the message that's on my mind this morning, but the fact that the angel didn't appear before the kings. The angel didn't appear before the high and the mighty. He appeared before the, the lowly, the ones that people looked down on, the ones that uh, others, much like Pharaoh, looked down on shepherds and thought they were trash. Much of the world would look down on this individual. He wasn't high. He wasn't mighty. He wasn't a noble or a king. But the angel appeared before him. Nearly 2,000 years ago, there was a night that an angel appeared before a shepherd. Y'all believe that? I believe and I understand and Scripture teaches that there was a night nearly 2,000 years ago that truly an angel appeared before a shepherd and proclaimed the true gospel for the first time on this earth. Not that Jesus was coming. Not that we're looking forward to it anymore. This was not some prophecy that's hard to understand of his or her seed shall bruise thy head and he'll bruise his heel. That's a prophecy that's kind of hard to understand. We read it here in Isaiah, and we can find even in the New Testament, uh, we can find that it's confusing and, and hard to understand. When Peter asked him, understand this, what thou readest? He says, how can I, except some man show me? He was reading Isaiah. I don't believe that was Peter there, but either way. The apostle come to him and asked him, understand what you read. He's reading Isaiah. This wasn't some hard to understand prophecy. This was not a foretelling of what was going to come. Nearly 2,000 years ago, an angel appeared in the heavens and appeared before that shepherd and said, This day in the town of Bethlehem is born unto you a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Amen. And a multitude of the heavenly hosts 
appeared before that shepherd and sang praises to the glory and the truth that Jesus Christ was truly born of a virgin in the city of Bethlehem, not in the inn. There wasn't room there, but in the barn. Y'all believe that? It's true. All of it is true. That's a blessed truth. That no matter how hard it may get, how confusing the world may be, no matter how much loss and suffering and sickness and troubles we may be faced with, there truly was a Savior born that night, which is Christ the Lord. I want to look at that a little bit this morning. I've been looking at it for the last uh, few weeks about our high priest. I want to go just to, just one more week. It's still on my heart and mind. Um, it's not normal for me to necessarily have a, a holiday message on the holiday weekend, but I'm thankful this morning I do, and that the Lord's been on me for weeks about this. I want us to understand him and understand the truth of it. And I want to look at this verse here in Isaiah 9 that everybody knows so well and try to understand just a little bit more from it. It says, For unto us a child is born. We need to be thankful for that. Jesus Christ was truly indeed born of a virgin. As hard as that is for our mind to comprehend, to understand, this is not as many of the other translations want to place her as just being a young lady. This is not just a young lady. She is literally, scientifically, physically a virgin. She'd known no man. And yet that night, she gave birth to a son. Just as the other angel appeared before her, his adopted father Joseph and said, she shall bring forth a son. That child was born. Matthew 1, 21. She shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call him Jesus. When that shepherd came that night to see that child that was born, he showed up. That shepherd that came to see the child that was born, the Savior that was born, when he arrived and he asked, asked Joseph, asked Mary, what is this son's name? He knew it was Christ the Lord. You know, Christ the Lord's not his name. That's his title. Christ means anointed. He knew he was the anointed Lord that was with him. But what is his name? What can I call him? You know what Joseph said? Jesus. Just like the angel said. There's one more thing in there the angel said. For he shall save his people from their sins. That child was born. And it was of a necessity that he was born. He was made to be flesh for us. He could not do what he came to do if that was not the case. God cannot die. Did y'all know that? God cannot die. He could not just simply come to this earth and go to the cross for us. God cannot die. He had to be made flesh for us. All of the bloods of bullocks and lambs and doves and all of the things that were sacrificed in the Old Testament were told in the book of Hebrews cannot wipe away sin. The blood of a lamb, the blood of a, a literal lamb and turtle dove and pigeon and ram and bullock and everything else that was sacrificed there cannot wash away sin. It has to be the blood of a man, the blood of a person, a human, to wash away the sins of blood, or the price of sin. It had to be the blood of a man. So he was made to be flesh for us. A child was born. Be thankful for that. But more importantly, this morning, I want to really spend some time. I'd love to go down through all the names that were given him. Wonderful. 
Y'all know that's not just, wow, that's amazing. Wonderful there means he is literally full of wonder. He astounds us still today. He did things that we cannot do, cannot comprehend, and cannot repeat. <coughs> he brought the dead back to life. He gave sight to the blind. He gave words to the mute. He gave strength to the powerless. He did all of these things that are, is, he is full indeed of wonder and astonishment. Counselor, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace. I'd love to go through all those names. That's not my focus this morning. This morning, I want us to really spend some time in considering, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That's the portion of this verse I really want us to spend some time in looking at this morning. Unto us a son is given. Now many times when you think about this, the, the thoughts of a gift is what we consider. Right? Amen? And that's true. Truly, Jesus being born was a gift to us. It is something we could not purchase, we could not afford, we could not get. I mean, let's be honest. When, when you were a child, how often were you thankful when you ripped open the gift and you found socks? Reminds me of a Christmas story. They looked at them and go and chunked them over their back. But how about when you ripped something open that you knew good and well, you couldn't afford, you couldn't get, there's no way possible you could have had this except someone was to give it to you. Boy, then now that's a gift you remember. Of a truth, Jesus being born of a virgin was a gift to us that God gave to us. And that is absolute truth. I don't deserve him. I couldn't afford him. I couldn't make it happen. If Joseph would have been with his wife, he still wouldn't have been able to be born. This was a gift of God. Absolutely. Amen. This time of year, I love looking at Scripture and seeing a gift. Jesus was a gift. Eternal life is a gift. We're told in the book of Romans that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. I love to consider gifts. Reality of a gift. It is not yours when you take possession of it. It is not yours when you rip it open and see what it is. It's not yours whenever you use it. It is yours the moment it is purchased and your name is placed upon it. That's when it became yours. Jesus being born of a virgin was yours the moment God said it before the foundation of the world. Eternal life is not yours when you possess it. It is not yours whenever you actually get around to using it. It was yours the moment it was purchased and your name was placed upon it. The free gift of God is eternal life. That's the truth of a gift. Many times we consider it as becoming ours whenever we go take it out from under the tree and rip the package open and get it out of the box and set it in the floor and start playing with it the first time. That's when it became mine. Wrong. It was yours the moment your parents purchased it and placed your name on it. It was yours waiting for you to possess it and use it. That's the truth of a gift. And absolutely, Jesus is a gift unto us absolutely never forget that but this morning i want us to look a little further than that i want us to understand truly what is being said here because i don't believe necessarily that when it says that unto us a son is given is he saying just that he gave us his son of a truth john three sixteen. for god so loved the world that he gave his son He's not just talking there about the death, that he gave up his life for that. When Jesus hung on the cross, he gave up the Spirit and went home. <coughs> the give here means more than that. There's another time in Scripture that this word give is used that I want us to look at as a comparison. Now go with me to the book of 
1 Samuel chapter 1. The fact and the truth that God tells us here in Isaiah that He gave us His Son means so much more than just a gift. And I hope it gives us better understanding of it. 1 Samuel chapter 1, you find the story of Hannah, the mother of the prophet Samuel. I'm not going to spend the time to read it all just to, for the conservation of time. I, I hope and trust that you have read it in the past, but if you've not, Hannah was barren. She was one of two wives of her husband Eli, and her, uh, the other wife had had many sons and daughters, we're told by this time. And Hannah felt despised. She felt cheated. She felt low. She felt like she was not accomplishing what she should be accomplishing because she had not brought forth any children. She was barren. So she prayed to God a prayer. And in this prayer, you find the same give as you find in Isaiah 9. Read verse 11. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thy handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a man-child. Now that give is the same give as a gift. She is asking truly indeed, God, I cannot have a child. I've tried. I've struggled with it. My husband and I have tried over and over again. We've done everything we know. We can't get children no matter what we try. Lord, I need you to give me one. She's asking for the gift of a son. That give is truly the gift that she is seeking. Her give is the same give as found in Isaiah. And not forget thy handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a man-child. Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. And there shall no razor come upon his head. How many of you have done this? I know we have. So don't try to cover it up. You've got something that you're wanting from the Lord. You, you, and you begin to bargain with him. None of us have ever done that, right? Lord, if you'll do A, B, and C, I promise from this day forward I'll do D, E, F. I promise. I promise I will, Lord. That's what Hannah's doing. Hannah says, Lord, I can't have children. I've tried and I've tried and I've tried. I feel like I'm a failure. I'm belittled. I'm, I'm mocked and made fun of. My husband says that he loves me, but how can he when I can't bring him a child? I need your help, Lord. And if you'll give me a son, I will give him to you and your service. The give there is not a gift. Hannah is saying that, Lord, if you will give me a son... I will devote him. I will commit him. His life purpose will be to serve you. I will give him to this purpose. That's what Hannah's saying. I will see to it, Lord, that this child is devoted to the work of your temple. If you'll just give him to me. He does. She bargains with the Lord. And the Lord answers her prayer. Now, unlike many of us, when we bargain with the Lord, and we say, we'll do our DEF, we tend to hold it back and forget what we say. I hope I'm not alone in that. Hannah does it. This is the give that I want us to understand in Isaiah. God says that unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given. There's something I want you to understand at that moment that is very important. That is not the moment that he became the Son of God. Y'all know that, right? Jesus did not become the Son of God at the moment of his conception in the womb of a virgin. He did not become the Son of God at that time. 
He did not become the Son of God the moment that that angel proclaimed that this day is born unto you a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. That's not the moment he became the Son of God. The moment that he came up out of the waters in being baptized and the Spirit descended upon him like a dove is not the moment he became the Son of God. He is the Son of God. There are three that bear a record in heaven. God, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And the Word became flesh. There are things in Scripture that we can agree to disagree upon and still fellowship. Um, one of them is end times. You can disagree with me on what I think on end times. I can disagree with you on end times. And you want to know, both of us are probably going to get proved wrong to some degree when that day comes. I know there is a day when Jesus is coming back and he is going to separate the sheep from the goats. And that's going to be the end. Everything that precedes that, I can be wrong, you can be wrong, we're probably both wrong. God knows what's right. And we can agree to disagree and we can get along just fine. Whether or not Paul was born again or converted on the road to Damascus. There are some that think one. There are some that think the other. And we can agree to disagree. At the end of the day, I don't think it matters. He was a born again child of God that when Jesus appeared before him, he answered the call and he followed the walk. That's the only thing that matters, really. We can agree to disagree and we can still fellowship. But there are things in Scripture that we're told that we don't agree to disagree upon in fellowship. And that being, Jesus is the Son of God. He always has been, always will be. There are three that bear record in heaven. God, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Some of the earliest heresies that come into the church and still try to come into the church is saying that Jesus is not God. Jesus is God. That child that was born, began at the moment of conception. That child that was born came into our possession the moment he came into this world. But the son that was given has always been. Has always been. Just as Samuel was committed by his mother to the work of the temple prior to his birth, Jesus, the child, was committed prior to his existence by God himself. That's amazing. That's impressive. God said before this son was born, before, y'all please understand what I'm saying, before that child was born, God had committed him to the work of our salvation. We read in Revelation in two places where Jesus stood as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Before he came here, he was already given to the work of our salvation. It kind of puts a different twist in there in Romans when it says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Jesus has been committed. He has been devoted by God himself for the work of our salvation from the foundation of the world. Jesus has been committed to our salvation. Is that not an awesome thought? What is going to stop that? If God be for us, who can be against us? Unto us a son is given. That's what he's talking about in John 3 when he says, For God so loved the world that he gave. He committed his son to our salvation. Hannah says that, Lord, if you'll give me a son, I'll give him to the service of your temple. It's the same with Jesus. He's given to the work of our salvation. What's amazing about this is you can continue to watch the life of Samuel at the beginning. And he is very much a type of Christ in this manner. He was committed to this service before 
he was born, if you'll flip over a little bit further into 2 Samuel chapter 2 and 26, you're going to hear a verse that sounds very much like Christ again. 2 and 26. Uh, Hannah actually did what she said she would do. When the child was weaned from her, she took that child to the temple and she gave him to the priest there and he was raised there and he began his work. Can you imagine how hard that would be? No mother wants to give up their child, even if it's for the betterment of the child. No mother wants to give up their child. God gave his son knowing what he was giving him to. And he was still willing to do it. But here in 1 Samuel chapter 2, in verse 26, it says, And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. You'll find a verse that's very similar to that in Luke chapter 2 and 52 when it talks about Jesus. He grew both in wisdom and in stature, both with God and and with men. He grew up. Not only did Hannah say, prior to this child being born, that I will commit him unto you, Lord, the, the child committed himself to the work of the temple. Samuel committed himself to this. And you find that continued on uh, in the third chapter. I'll give you one more section as we continue on our thoughts. In third chapter of 1 Samuel, verse 19. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan even to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. Samuel lived his life in a way of showing that he was committed to the ministry of God and to the temple. Jesus did the same thing. Look with me in Ephesians chapter 5. You're going to see this same terminology used when it talks about Jesus in his life. In Ephesians 5 and 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. This section of scripture and this portion where he talks about Jesus loves the church and gave himself for it is not talking about his death. Again, when Jesus hung on the cross, he gave up, his, gave up the spirit, gave up the ghost and went home to heaven. But this is not talking about his death. This is talking about his life. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature both with God and men, and he lived a committed, devoted life for us. God said all the way back in Isaiah that this child is born, and that son is given and committed to your salvation. And we're told here in Ephesians 5 that Jesus committed his life to us. Not just for our eternal salvation, but for our daily salvation. Jesus lived his everyday life devoted to being a perfect example for us. God gave us the perfect answer for our need of salvation. And that was a perfect son. It was given and committed to us. That's an awesome thought. It's one that's worthy of being celebrated and devoted to in our everyday life. And I'm thankful for opportunities that the Lord gives us to be reminded of that. And celebrate it. Don't get lost in the arguments of whether or not we're supposed to celebrate Christmas. Don't get lost in that argument. It's the same as Easter. Don't get lost in the argument of whether or not we're supposed to celebrate Easter. It's a time and a moment that we remember Christ. It's a time and a moment where the world is challenged to remember. And we need to be reminded that he was given and committed to 
every aspect of our lives. I thank you. God bless.